Welcome to the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast powered by Hiscox. I'm your host, Sanjay Parekh. Throughout my career, I've had side hustles, some of which have turned into real businesses. But first and foremost, I'm a serial technology entrepreneur. In the creator space, we hear plenty of advice on how to hustle harder and why you can sleep when you're dead. On this show, we ask new questions in hopes of getting new answers. Questions like, how can small businesses work smarter? How do you achieve balance between work and family? How can we redefine success in our businesses so that we don't burn out after year three? Every week, I sit down with business founders at various stages of their side hustle to small business journey. These entrepreneurs are pushing the envelope while keeping their values. Keep listening for conversation, context, and camaraderie. Over 27 years ago, Steve Zengut founded Zeke. Under his leadership, it has become Southern California's leading agency for web, interactive, and mobile development. Steve works with a large virtual team of engineers, designers, creative directors, and production managers who create content on multiple platforms. Here today to share more about his business, how he balances family and work, and his life as an entrepreneur is Steve Zengut. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sanjay. Happy to be here. So I love, uh, before we get into like uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of the business and how uh, you make everything work, I'd love to get a little bit about your background and what got you to the point that you're at right now. Sure. Um, I actually, uh, I have a film degree. So I, uh, I, I studied film in, in, in college. It's all I wanted to be when I was a kid and uh, got into the, uh, got into Hollywood, got into the film industry and uh, hated every minute of it. Um, <laughs> um, just, you know, very quickly just realized it didn't want to be there. It wasn't the place for me. And, uh, you know, I kind of went searching for something else. Um, this is in early 90s, very early, or very early 90s. And so when I left, I went and I got a a uh, graphic design job because I, I knew that the, the computer was starting to happen. It really wasn't quite a thing yet, but I really want to learn the ins and outs of the computer. And so I went and I, I got a graphic design job. Um, the job was interesting because it was a third shift job. My, my shift started at 5 wow. p.m. And so most of my shifts went from about 5 p.m. until at least 1 a.m., uh, sometimes until 3 a.m. Um, but we were printing, what we were doing was we were designing um, those full-page car ads for the uh, Sunday paper. Um, and so we would spend about three or four hours designing um, and then about five hours printing because this is the early 90s. And, and we yeah. literally had to print, we had to print CMYK full page. There were 12 panels that took about maybe 20 minutes each to, to print in those days. Wow. And so what I did with that downtime is I actually taught myself how to code. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, and so, and so that's where, that's sort of where the whole idea for the, uh, the business came from. Yeah. Um, did you feel the, uh, uh, regret at all in, in like you get, went and got this film degree and you're like, I, I hate this. Um, no. Like, so, so no. what, what kind of helped you make that move then? Like, and and here's here's the thing. I mean, what what it was called, what I what I was doing at the time, what I was learning was multimedia. I don't I don't really think that's a term anymore. But um, <laughs> right. I you know I I mean you've been around the industry uh you know kind of as long as I have. So I was learning macromedia director. Yeah. Uh, at the time, that's what I taught myself how to how to how to do. I was learning how to build CD ROMs and and presentations and 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 multimedia. So it. I was learning how to code, but it it also spoke to you know my film background um, yeah. because it was always it was also very creative, and so that um, that's what really kept me kept me interested and, and kept me into it. Yeah, um, the web was starting to happen around 1995, and I saw it starting to happen, and I actually wrote a business plan for my boss uh, at the graphic design shop to to start a web agency under his umbrella. Um, uh, he loved it. His business partners did not, um, and so um, he said no. And I, I, I quit that day and uh, went and started Zeke. Wow, wow! So quit yeah. that day. So um, I got to ask you, like, is this your first ever entrepreneurial venture, or did you do things entrepreneurial as a kid, or were there entrepreneurs in the family that you saw as as examples of this? Yeah, great question. My dad was an entrepreneur, a, a okay. serial entrepreneur. So um, my dad, so I grew up at a um, around um, picture framing and and, uh, and art, and so that's what my my dad's business was. Uh, he had a custom picture framing uh, shop, uh, and he sold art. Um, and so there was a you know I, I was always around, um, you, you know seeing my dad be self-employed and, and understanding what it meant to network and, 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 and learning about customer service. I went to work for my dad when I was eight. 
Um, and so my dad had a, um, so we were in Cincinnati, uh, at the time and he had a, um, um, a picture frame shop called frame and save. That's what the first one I had to, I had to go back a few. It was called frame and save. And it was a, it was a custom framing and DIY. So he, he offered both. And so okay. you could pay for custom framing or if you didn't, if it, that was too expensive, then he'd give you the materials and he literally had four or six stalls in the front of the shop uh, wow. with, with a, with a vice grip and he'd give you the materials and you build the frame yourself. And that was my job. I was there to teach people how to build a picture frame at, at, at eight. And so I was really, I, I don't know. I, don't, I honestly don't remember if my dad was paying me. If he was, it wasn't, it wasn't a lot, but I was getting tips. Um, and so um, that's, that was probably my first job. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating um, and so interesting to, to, I've never heard of a DIY picture frame shop like I, that. I think it was one of the only, <laughs> and I'm sure it, it definitely wouldn't fly today because you'd probably have to sign a waiver or just walking in the door. I mean, he was literally <laughs> handing people nails and a saw and, um, it, 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 but it was, this was the seventies. I mean, you know, yeah. what do you want? You, you, you didn't yeah. have all the lawyers and the, and the waivers and all that stuff back no. then. No. So, um, uh, okay. So, so fascinating. Uh, so when you, when you quit your job, um, and started up Zeke, how did you kind of figure, I mean, this is your first time starting up an, an agency like this. Like how, where did you go find the first customers and, and clients and everything? Yeah. Great question. Um, I, I started with, uh, zero clients and no prospects and, uh, no money. Um, it was, it was just an idea. So a business. winning formula right from the start. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I had, I had this business plan, um, and I kind of knew where I wanted to take it. But what I did is, is, um, you know, I, I, I had, you know, we started the company. I, um, we, we were kind of building things and I would just go out every day and meet with whoever would listen to me. Um, and I would tell them about what we were thinking. And so we didn't make a dime for two years. Um, wow. And so I was working, I was actually, you know, while starting the business, I got a, a job teaching at a, a university in Burbank, uh, teaching multimedia. Um, it's kind of how I made ends meet. Um, and again, my, my day was just spent networking. And I, I was literally just going and meeting anybody who would talk to me about web and um, video games. We were making some video games. We were doing CD-ROMs. We were doing a lot of different things. Um, we got our first paying gig in, I want to say the end of 96, right around okay. the end of 96. Um, and that was for a, um, do you remember the movie Multiplicity? With, oh, yeah. Uh, Michael Keaton? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we um, we connected with uh, a woman who was the, um, the head of the ad agency for Multiplicity, and she hired us to build uh, five games for their for their website. Oh, cool! Okay, yeah. so um, so during this, so basically, you're running this as a side hustle because you've got a full time job um, and you're doing this. How are you balancing these two things? Like, because some of these um, meetings you're having to do during the day, I'm imagining. And do you have yeah, teaching responsibilities? I think the, then? The, 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 yeah, the teaching stuff, um, you know, because it was part time, it sort of worked within my schedule. So I okay. think I think my classes were I, I had two classes in uh, in the early morning on maybe a Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah. And then I maybe had an evening class um, and that that was about it. Uh, the rest of the time was just spent literally. So I was living in the valley and driving over to L.A. Uh, every day and just taking meetings. Um, and again, it was any, anybody that would listen to me. Um, but it paid off because as soon as, as soon as, as soon as we got our first job, as soon as it hit, then everybody kind of knew who we were and it, and it, and it, it, the floodgates opened it, Yeah, it did, the work just started coming in. So, so the key was getting that first gig. What did it take to get that? Like, how were you able to, to A lot unlock of that? <laughs> um, you know what? So, um, it's funny. We, so. Um, I, I also, in addition to, I didn't sleep a lot during this, during this period, by the way, um, <laughs> literally didn't, didn't sleep a lot. I, I was maybe getting, you know, four hours of sleep on a good night. Well, don't and worry. So, We're going to talk about work-life balance in a minute, yeah, but, but keep going. Yeah. Um, so during this, during this time, we also, um, I, I led a, uh, a user group. It wasn't a meetup. There wasn't, there wasn't meetup yet. So this was right. called a, a SIG, a special interest group, yep. um, at the Los Angeles Macintosh group. And so they gave me a, they gave me a SIG, a multimedia SIG. And so I started leading that. And during that time they held a, 
a trade show also in Burbank. Um, and because I was leading the SIG voluntarily, they gave me a booth. They had an extra booth space. They gave nice. me a booth. And so what we did is we, I, I literally just, I, I found a, a, a beat up couch on the side of the road. Um, I put it in the back of my truck. Um, we set up a couch with a, with a rug and a, and a coffee machine at, at the trade show. And that was our booth. And it was basically, we called it, so we were doing a lot of shockwave at the time, which was Macromedia director, but it was online. We called it the shockwave lounge. And, and we literally just stood there and invited people to come in and take a load off and, and let me show you what we do. And we just happened to talk to the right lady. Um, and, and it was, it was, it was right at maybe the last hour of the trade show too. She came in, she stopped by, I showed her what we were doing and she said, this is exactly what I need. Um, and I, I want you to come and meet with me on Monday. Wow. Are, aren't you no. glad you didn't start, um, taking down the booth early there? Um, <laughs> like you see so many times in conference shows where people yeah. just like packing it up and yeah. there's still people walking around. Like you never know what, what might happen yeah. there. Yeah. And again, I think, you know, I think, you know, um, to me that that time period, you know, throughout sort of 95 to 2000, a lot of it was just hustle. Right. I was, yeah. I was, I was, I was anywhere, like I said, literally anyone that would listen to me, anybody would take a meeting, I would go and meet with and just talk to you because I never knew who was connected to who or who could introduce right. me to who. And I just went and met with everyone. And I think, it, it, you know, it just became a sort of a scattershot, you know, kind of numbers game. Um, and it, it, it worked. Yeah. Let, let's talk about um, one of the things that I think drives uh, or, or prevents a lot of people from being founders and entrepreneurs like this is, is the fear. Like, did you have fear during any of this time? Like this was not going to work. Like, how did you think about like the bad part of being a founder? Uh, yeah. I mean, we, you know, I always have fear. I still have fear to this day. I mean, yeah. fear's, fear's, fear's kind of natural. Like that's just, you know, that's, that, that's just being a uh, human, but I also had drive. Um, and so, um, I think, I think the, 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 there was fear that this wasn't going to succeed. That was always there. But to me, the, the, the fear that was driving me or was motivating me was, was the fear of having to go find a nine to five job again. Right. I, I, I didn't want to do that. I, that, that to me was scarier than, than doing my own thing. I knew, I knew it even at 23 that I was unemployable. Um, and so I, I truly, did have that fear of uh, going and getting a, a regular job. And, and that's, I think, what pushed me the most. Yeah. So, so you think that one fear overrode the other fears? Yeah. Essentially. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's still, it's funny. I mean, I've been doing this for 27 years and that's still a fear to this day. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, anyway. and, and how do you, how do you deal with that though? Like, I, because I think, you know, I talk to a lot of people and they're, a lot of people have those ideas. They want to be side hustlers. They want to start a small business, but they're, they're worried. They're fearful. Um, you know, like you, like hey, all the things I don't know and the things that I don't know that I don't know. Right. Like, how do you get over that? Um, because that's probably the constant as an entrepreneur, right? Like there's a lot of things we don't know and we don't know the things we don't know, but yet yeah. we still Year, do them. Years and years of therapy. No, <laughs> um, 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 I, you know what? Um, it's, it's funny you ask, and I think about this a lot because, you know, when I started the company, I was 25. Um, yeah. I did not know a lot. I did not know any better. Uh, all I knew was I, I wanted to, I wanted to start my own company and I, and I knew this uh, internet multimedia computer thing was, was sort of happen. I saw this wave coming, right? And so I knew that I knew I was onto something, um, but I didn't know any better. And what I think about these days is, if I had to do it all over again, would I do it now at 52 years old? Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you know, I, now I know a lot more. Right. Um, so it may have just been a, you know, a bunch of naivete, uh, during, during that time. Um, yeah. You, you have a lot more now that you could risk, uh, and yes. lose than, and, than probably back and, then. And that's another piece of it. I mean, now I have, you know, I have a family and so I have, you know, I have responsibility, I have a lot more responsibilities and, and, not, and, and, you know, I, I had a family back then too, when I, you know, um, and yeah. so, um, it's just, again, I think, um, you know, a lot of it was just me being young. Um, yeah. but I think what kept me going, I think what, what got me truly past that fear is, 
Um, I, I know what I do have is hustle. Uh, or, or grit, or you pick a word. Um, you know, that's yeah. something that I, you know, I've kind of had all my life. So, no, no, that that that's what what get got me over that hump was. Look, I I, I know I can make something happen. And, yeah, and I know how I have the uh, the motivation to, to 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 try hard enough to make it happen. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about something that we touched on before the 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 lack of sleep that you had in the early time. <laughs> um, how do you think about? kind of those, those boundaries and, and work-life balance and, and how did you think about them then? And how do you think about them now? Yeah. And by, by the way, um, um, you know, even though I didn't get a lot of sleep back in those days, I do not recommend that to anybody. That's, 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 yeah. it's, that is a horrible way to work. It's, it, 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 I look back on the time as, um, as, as, as terrible. And a lot of, a lot of people in my industry, a lot of coders and developers, uh, treat those all nighters as sort of a badge of honor, right? And I've heard people talk about it. You know, if you, you didn't, you didn't pull in those all nighters, you're not, a, you're not a real coder. That's terrible. That's, that, none of that's true. <laughs> don't, 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 don't buy into that. Right. And so, um, um, you know, but I used to do it. I, I used to, you know, when we started getting contracts, not only was I, um, selling, but I was also coding, uh, you know, parts of it. And so I'd go and sell during the day and then I'd code until about, you know, three, four in the morning, um, and then maybe sleep until eight and then start my day all over again. I was coding all weekend, uh, sometimes. So I wasn't taking any downtime. Um, and that's, um, that's just not, not, not the way to be. It's, 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 it's stressful. Uh, it causes burnout. Um, my, you know, I, I was unhealthy. Um, you know, those habits are, are just not good. Yeah. Yeah. So what, at, at what point did you kind of realize this and kind of reset your, your priorities around this and, and how do you ensure that, that you do have those boundaries now? Just, just right now. I just, I've just realized it right now. <laughs> as we're talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, um, you know, it actually um, it actually took me a long time to uh, start setting healthy boundaries and and practicing work life balance and and it's been an evolution, right? And so yeah. I don't know that I can point to any one particular time. I know from ninety five to two thousand, you know, though that was probably my most unhealthy uh, period. Um, probably early two thousands, you know. Um, as I you know started to have uh, have kids and have family, I was taking some downtime, but not enough. Um, and it's only recently that I um, have hired people to take on uh, you know some of the tasks that that you know I'm not good at or that I don't like to do, and 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 you know start really practicing a healthy work life balance. Um, yeah. And so, like I said, it, it it it's been an evolution, and and it's still it's still you know, evolving. It's still something I, you know, I have to learn and kind of remind myself all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really easy to fall back into those kind of old habits and things that you, yeah. because you knew it was successful, right? Because now looking back at it, it all worked. So if you just do that, it'll all be good again, but that's, that's not necessarily it, true. Here's the thing I know is, is if you don't, if you don't practice any self-care, um, then you're not going to be good at whatever you're trying to do during your day. Right. And so that's, that's, that's my, that's the lesson I took away from all, all of that time is, is there were times where I wasn't, I was practicing zero self-care. Um, and, and, and frankly, the reason I was pulling all nighters is I was not as productive as I could have been had I been practicing proper self-care. Right. And that, that's sort of the rub, right? If you get, if you get a full eight hour sleep or more, right, then you're well, way more, uh, refreshed and productive during your day. And your, your, your days actually get shorter because you do more. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my big takeaway. Yeah. It's, it's a, it becomes a vicious cycle that becomes very hard to get out of. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think everybody does at some point they realize it and get out of it, but it's really hard. Um, to fix that. And I, I, I used to, you know, I used to measure it in cups of coffee and, and cans of Diet Coke, Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, I could see it. I could see, I could literally see on my desk, you know, how much caffeine, what my caffeine intake looked like. And, and, right. um, and I, I kind of knew that was a sign of, of me, me practicing unhealthy habits. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's, um, switch gears a little bit and, and talk about some of the things that you now leverage, uh, in terms of technology, apps, systems, um, to help you uh, manage the business, manage life, um, wh what's critical to you that that you couldn't live without? It's an interesting question. I thought about this question a lot. Uh, you know, when you sent it to me, um, I, I I read a book um, two years ago that really 
uh, changed my life. Um, and that was um, Rocket Fuel. Um, and, and, it, it, and it's a pretty simple book. It's just about the difference between visionaries and integrators. And my wife turned me on to it. Mm -hmm. um, and it helped me identify that, um, you know, there's, there's things I'm good at. I, I have a superpower, right. And, and, and there's things that I'm not good at. And more importantly, there's things I just don't like doing. Um, right. and, and so all of the stuff that was in the visionary section of the book, it was like reading my, you know, my biography, right. right? And all the stuff that was in the integrator section of the book, I said, I, I, I read it and I said, oh, this, this sounds awful. <laughs> This is, this is all, this is all awful. Right. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, that's all the, the running of the business stuff. It's the operation stuff. It's yeah. the, it's the project management. It's the paperwork. It's the human resources. It's yeah. the, right. And as an entrepreneur, I think, you know, myself included and, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of my friends that I know that run other agencies think that you have to do it all. Um, as a, as, as a business owner. And, and that's just not true. And so, um, two years ago I, I read the book and, and I hired a, uh, a COO, uh, and she came in and she just started handle, handling all the, the stuff that an integrator is supposed to do so yeah. that I can just go and stay and be a visionary and handle business development and handle networking and, and the stuff that I actually enjoy, uh, doing. Right. Um, and that by itself, um, that, that, you asked about sort of systems um, that has, I think what, what, what we've implemented over the past couple of years, that's really changed uh, the business and, and really changed my life. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a biggie. Yeah. Um, as far as technology and apps and, and things like that, um, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a list of what we use, um, but it doesn't necessarily matter what technology or apps that you use. Um, what really matters is how you use them um, and, and, what, and what kind of protocols and boundaries you put in place. So ours are pretty standard, um, you know, for uh, daily communication. We use Zoom and Slack. Uh, we are fully remote, by the way. Uh, so we okay. went fully remote about, uh, about five years ago. So pre-pandemic, we were already fully remote. And so we were kind of all set up when the, uh, when the pandemic hit. And, so and what, what and motivated that change? What, what drove you guys to do that? My wife, <laughs> yeah. my wife actually is a COO uh, as well. Not not in the uh, not in the uh, technology industry, but she is a COO. Uh -huh. um, she came in and 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 sort of looked at the expense of the office space that we had, and yeah. and how many clients I I wasn't seeing there, and and said I. I, I don't understand this. I don't know why you're you're doing this. And so, why do you have this big office that nobody yeah. sees? Yeah, and it turns out I, I was I was actually the one that was holding on to the office. None of the employees wanted to be there. Nobody wanted to commute. Yeah, right? and I was really the only one that. There were many days I would go in. I was literally the only one in the office. Wow. Um, and so that right there saved me seventy five hundred dollars a month uh, because you know Amazing. office space isn't cheap here in Huntington Beach. And so right. And so going fully remote was was a big deal for us. Um, and so then we again we started using uh, Zoom, Slack, and and phone calls. Um, uh, and so again, just, you know, video chat and some sort of communication software. Um, but what, what matters is the, the, the protocol that we have in place and, and what really helps with, with remote work. I know this isn't your exact question, but really, really has helped us with our, our remote systems is, um, making sure that all of our people are, are accountable. Right. And mm -hmm. so, so none of those systems work if, if people aren't, aren't using them or they don't respond or they're, you know, right. you can't get a hold of them. And, and so accountability is a big, is a big piece of that for us. Yeah. So how, how do you, um, I, I think this is an interesting area and we've, we've touched on this in other interviews. How are you doing that accountability and making sure, because now you can't see the team, right? So you don't know what they're doing. And I think that's one of the biggest fears of a lot of managers, a lot of mm -hmm. owners because now I'm paying people, but I don't actually know what they're doing. And and conceivably, you now have a team that's also not even necessarily local, and they're dispersed probably geographically. So how do you yep. how do you make sure that you're getting the best work, all of the work out of your your people? So one of the things that remote that going remote unlocked for us uh, was the ability to um, it, it it opened up our hiring radius. We didn't have one anymore, right? We do generally work on U.S on U.S. time zones. So most of our employees are, are based in the U.S. Um, um, we have one in Argentina. We have one in the Dominican, but but most of our, our people are, are U.S. based. Um, so now we didn't have to hire in Southern California anymore. We could, we could hire all over the place. And so what that did for us was 
uh, allowed us to be a little bit more selective with with who we hire, uh, and made sure just from the get go that we were hiring people that were responsible, were accountable, could you know could and 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 could deliver and sort of work within um, you work within their own space and 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 hold themselves uh, to a uh, to a higher standard. So that's sort of the that's the foundation of it all. It all starts there. If you don't have the right people, um, nothing you put in place is going to work. Right, um, but. You know, we use um, some of the other tools that we use because we're a development shop. We use Teamwork for project management. We use GitHub uh, for for tracking all of our code. And so we're we're in a um, we're in an environment where it actually is somewhat easier to to track. You know, we can right. see what code commits people are turning in. Right, we can see what sort of progress they're making on a on a daily or weekly basis. Right, or 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 quicker than that if the if the cadence requires it um, and so so we you know we have uh, daily weekly you know monthly deliverables that each of our team members is responsible for um, and so we we can those can be tracked um, not all industries are like that but we actually have right. tangible things that people are turning in so we know we we know in general if people are delivering or not yeah yeah so um, Steve thinking back it's been 27 years now that you've been doing this Um is can you point to one thing or maybe even a couple of things that now reflecting back that you would do differently like knowing what you know now <laughs> what would you have done differently uh, um well that's a good question um <laughs> you know i i think um i think i probably would have brought on um people to handle the operations uh stuff sooner uh, yeah. in my business. Um, not that we were doing anything wrong, but there were probably a lot of missed opportunities for us along the way, uh, yeah. just from a processy standpoint, a system standpoint, you know, we could have been on, we could have been leaner. We could have been more efficient, uh, uh, along the way. Um, and you know, we made mistakes as a result. So I, you know, I would have, I would have brought people in, uh, uh, sooner. Um, yeah, that's probably that's that's probably the that, that's probably the one thing I can point to. Um yeah. and just because that that delegation and, and and partnering with those people that I brought in over the past couple of years has been so key to our uh, our growth um uh in, in in recent years. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um okay, uh so last question for you. Uh for our listeners that are thinking about taking the leap. Uh, and launching a side hustle like you did or taking a side hustle and making a full-time business, do you have any advice for them in kind of that journey they're about to embark on? Sure. Um, I would focus on the word hustle uh, in, in that in that question, right? Because any side hustle you do uh, requires uh, work and requires hustle and requires um, just a constant drive uh, to make it to make it happen. It's not it's not going to happen on its own. Um, and so the only reason you know that not the only reason, but a big part of our success at Zeke over the past twenty seven years has been you know the drive, the motivation, right? Um, the that 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 hustle piece of it. And it takes uh, you know it takes some grit. Um, not everybody has it, and that's okay, right? And so I think. It's important that you ask yourself, uh, you know, that honest question is, do, do you have the motivation to do it uh, before you take that leap? And if you don't know, ask a, ask a close friend, a true friend who's going to be honest with you um, to, to, to let you know if you, if you, if you have it. Um, because it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's not for everybody. Um, and, and, and that's okay too, right? Um, um, the other thing I'd say is... Um, if you are going to, you know, start a side hustle, you are going to, you are going to start your own business, find something that you are truly passionate about. Find something you love. I love this business. I really do love the technology industry. There's some challenge every day. I read all the time, I'm always learning something. That's what drives me to, uh, to stay in this business. And, and it's, it's, when it, it's what, what's going to keep us in business another 27 years. Don't, don't start a side hustle for money. It, it, it won't last. <laughs> Yeah, that that Mon is a great piece let me say of advice. That, let me say that differently. Don't start it for money alone. <laughs> right? If, if right. you're just in it for the money, it's not going to last. You, yeah. you have to have something that 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 uh, you're passionate about. Yeah, the passion definitely runs out if you're only in it for the money. You've got to have something guaranteed on that for sure. Yeah, um, Steve, this has been fantastic. Where can our listeners find and connect with you? 
Uh, sure. Um, you know, I'm uh, I'm on 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 all the social networks. Uh, my nickname is typically Zengi, Z E N G Y. Uh, so Twitter, uh, it, Twitter at Zengi is fine. Uh, LinkedIn, I believe it's also Zengi. Uh, Facebook, uh, I'm there as well. Or you can just go to Zeke.com and and fill out our form, and and usually just come straight to me. There you go. Awesome. Thanks for coming on the show, Steve. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast, powered by Hiscox. To learn more about how Hiscox can help protect your small business through intelligent insurance solutions, visit hiscox.com. 